Namaste and in La Catch, and welcome to this episode of One World in a New World. I'm your host, Zen Benefiel, and this week's guest is a very special, almost octogenarian, from and coming to us from Ecuador. Her name is Suzanne Donahue, and in her life, she's been a poet, a companion, a student of life, a treasurer. She's a master teacher of Reiki, and she's also a leader of joy retreats there in Ecuador. Stick with us and let's find out more of what she can offer in insights and wisdom. Great to have you here, Suzanne, and welcome. Thank you. It's very good to be here. You know, it's so wonderful to be able to have these kinds of conversations across the world post-COVID, because this gave us the opportunity to do so. It's a wonderful silver lining, isn't it? It is indeed. Best now, thing to come out of COVID. And there's more to come. Now, we talk about things that you and others, and, and we'll, you'll find out just how that's done in a moment, but we talk about this inner revelation that's happening within people at some point in their life. And, you know, we both, we as humanity live half inside and half outside. We're often bereft of talking about the inside because sometimes it sounds pretty crazy to others and we don't want to risk appearing the fool, even though the fool is off the wise. So with your experience, Suzanne, and obviously from your history of things, it appears that you had an early inkling of a connection beyond this world that you found internally. What was that like? I grew up in a family that was proudly atheist. But I sensed there was a world behind this one. I could, I could connect with it by lying on the grass, looking at the clouds, uh, lying in bed, listening to the mockingbird, not the mockingbirds, the meadowlark singing mm. in Southern beautiful California. Song. Beautiful song, incredibly beautiful. And I just knew there was something more. When I was about 12, I noticed that there was a column of white light going all the way from my feet to the top of my head, just this straight column of white light. And I wondered about that. I went to Bible camp and uh, stuff like that. That had to have been a phenomenal experience just in blowing your mind to begin with. It's like, what is this? Yes, and you know, I had a little picture of Jesus that was about this big and the cross part glowed in the dark. So I would relate that column to the picture glowing and mm -hmm. um, just feel like I was safe in a way that I wasn't during the daytime, safe in that column, safe in that light. Mm -hmm. uh, it went away shortly after I was 12. I think it had been there before, but I I didn't remember that it was really there until it went away. Mm. And then I thought, what did I do wrong? <laughs> so perhaps it wasn't, I, you know, perhaps it was just that moment of experiential understanding where you, you had to have a direct experience of it that would then unfold. It wasn't until much later that I found out this is a very common experience for children. Mm. And it generally does go away at puberty. And I didn't didn't know that. But now that I know that, I, I think about all the times that I really tried to connect to the person of Jesus, the personality of Jesus. I would go, my high school friends would invite me to these Billy Graham rallies and things like that. And I would go up front and try to become a Christian and it never worked. It just never worked. 
So I, I tried every kind of church you can go to. I tried everything. The first time I did it, I was 10. I walked about half a mile with my uh, eight-year-old brother to the nearest Methodist church. Hmm. And they gave an altar call. And I went straight up front because this is what I was there for. I wanted that direct connection with the spirit of love. And um, the minister looked at me and said, well, what would you guys like? <laughs> and I said, I want to be connected like he just said. You know, that's that's the point of my coming forward. And my brother said, don't look at me. I just came with her. <laughs> <laughs> but the minister thought, okay, well, we'll try to get this pair involved in the church. And what I ended up doing at 10 years old was typing on those old mimeograph sheets. They were green and the keys would punch holes in them mm -hmm. and you'd be able to run off the church bulletin. So I was typing all the time for the church. And I that's how I ended up in the Bible camps uh, during, during uh, summers. But nothing what, really- What, they need a stenographer? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Really, um, nothing really took until I was 27 years old. I've been through all kinds of stuff, practice marriages and, mm. you know, graduating from college and just everything. But I was driving a car that I had inherited from my latest um Practice, Practice marriage. marriage. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. And um, I was in the mountains of Southern California. The snow was melting. It was October. The snow was running across the road, made it very slippery. And um, I was driving along behind this long train of cars. And I was feeling very impatient. So I decided to try to pass the people in front of me. And when I did that, the car ended up 180 degrees going down the wrong side of the road. Hmm. Fortunately, everybody was going slow enough. They were able to stop. And I ended up, after doing the U-turn, and I ended up, facing over the edge of the side of the road, which at that point was about 150 feet of rock. Mm. And I that was a spooky really, situation, huh? I was really sad. I was really, really sad when I sort of came to myself and realized I wasn't dead. Mm. And that was a revelation to me. Wow, that's an All interesting right. hopeful. I had no realization until that moment that I really didn't want to be here anymore. And then I realized there's something wrong with this picture. Hmm. I'm 27 years old and I don't want to be here. But it, that was the truth of who I was at that moment. And I just, I'd heard about Jesus. I would tried to call on Jesus. I had tried every kind of thing I could and but that was the only thing I knew to do was just say Jesus help me and then I felt the presence just sitting there beside me in the car I couldn't see anything but I mm -hmm. felt it here here I am okay no words but they had been talking this was in the 70s they had been talking about turning your life over to jesus turning your car keys over to jesus so right. <laughs> i tried that and the response that i got was i don't do it that way not the way i roll i will teach you how to drive i will ride with you but i don't take over and i just i fell in love with the person who said that to me it the, resonates, first, right? You're... the first person who didn't want me to be better 
or try harder or not make so many mistakes. Just the mm -hmm. first person who accepted me as I was. So, you know, the relation. It's isn't it? It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. And over the years, um, I've doubted and questioned and done everything that people usually do, but he's always there for me. Mm -hmm. And it's up to and us I to don't the truth see it too. as I'm sorry. I say it's up to us to question the truth. Is yeah, I don't see it? it as definitively this is the only person who has ever uh what's the word? Express God. Right. I don't think that's true. I think God expresses himself through everyone or she expresses herself or they that was express kind of his point too. That we all have a direct connect. That was his connect. point. We just don't exercise it. That was his point. And I, um, I didn't learn that for several years. I just started reading the Bible. I started going to church, doing all the things you're supposed to do, trying to find that direct connection I knew that the, it existed because it had happened to me, but I wanted to be connected all the time. And anybody who would tell me that that was possible, I would go do what they told me. Hmm. And finally... Kind of confirmation bias, right? Yeah. Finally, <laughs> I learned. Finally, I learned that this is how we're all created. We're meant to constantly be in connection with the spirit how else are we going to survive <laughs> right and as quantum physics now is proven it's all vibration well what's that mm -hmm. that's a sensory experience beyond thinking mm -hmm. yeah it's part of that being and you know we had some synchronicities lining up in our prelim when you mentioned the uh, methodist church i was raised in united methodist mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. being adopted my parents when my uh, sister arrived, I was four and a half. I'd had some Sunday school, so I knew there was a father and mother in heaven, right? And Jesus and all that. And they told me about the adoption process. And there was no doubt in my mind that the love was there. I, I had no question of mm -hmm. any kind of disconnection with them. And I really wasn't that, all that concerned about why my biologicals gave me up. It, it just, I, I had no angst there. Mm -hmm. What I walked away with was a question of, if I have a father and mother in heaven, can I talk to them? Because I yes. want to know more. Yes. And turns out I could. There was mm -hmm. a voice that appeared just, I don't know if it was weeks or maybe a month later. <clears throat> I was on the stairway in our home, elbows on the windowsill, looking out over the front porch and all was at night. And then all of a sudden I hear this big booming voice say, hey, you. And instead of interacting with it, I spun around right away and asked my mother if she heard it. And, of course, she didn't. Mm -hmm. And then I realized, oh, that's inside. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I know what I heard. So how do I continue to, to engage that and actually create a conversation? So I used to spend nights in front of the window, <laughs> lights on in the house, can't see out. So addressing that fear of the dark. And mm -hmm. I would send that same, hey, you, in my mind, out, hoping for a return. Mm -hmm. And it probably took a few weeks, maybe a month or so. And I finally reached a place of quiet. Because you know how we ask for something and then we think about it incessantly. Mm -hmm. We don't know how to shut up internally. Mm -hmm. 70,000 thoughts a day, right? So. Yeah. <laughs> So I found that place and I heard the voice and we started a conversation and it's mm -hmm. been with me my entire life. Now it's like, it's part of me. So there's just and it is part of you. response. Absolutely. There's no separation. It's part of all the of spirit us. and the flesh. Yes. yes. And years later, um, reading the Vedas after my spiritual awakening as a teenager, I wanted to find some kind of corroboration of the wild ass experience I just had. And yeah. in, the in the Vedas, they say that um, basically we're all divine threads, incarnate, connected to source, and capable of God consciousness. So mm -hmm. what's that mean? 
we have a direct connect to the infinite intelligence to and to all with. and to all of those other stations around us mm -hmm. that's what they're calling collective consciousness right it's just all those stations communicating through the one channel it's all the threads in the tapestry right yeah. that, that provide this harmonious experience that we have yet to have and yet as a result of covid in my opinion it opened the door to especially with the obsession on self hygiene and sequestration the natural behavior modification sink in of that if you will is the self examination mm -hmm. yeah and you and I met because of that through the bench, which is one of yes. those groups that came up as a result yes. as well. Which so, is really a gift. It really is. Absolutely. And for those in the, in the audience, we're talking about the friendship bench that is put on by bizcatalyst360.com. And I encourage you to look it up and participate every Thursday morning, at least morning in the U.S. It's 1130 Eastern Standard Time. Um, absolutely wonderful conversations with others who are on the same path looking for themselves. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in this process, so when, once you realized, okay, the presence is here, right? I'm connected. It's there. You learn to inquire and then shut up, <laughs> which is ultimately the hardest to do. How did that progress? Where did it lead you to? And, and how did you experience that journey with others, both in, in positive and, and not so positive ways? Because we all tend to go through this and we, we need to understand there are just things we're going to experience and it's okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I was and still am i think a very concrete thinker and so i did all the things that you're supposed to do i found a church to go to i found a prayer group um and finally i decided i should go to seminary hmm. because i wanted to share with people this wonderful experience of you get to be loved. Right. Think of that. <laughs> well, don't we all? I mean, isn't that the core beyond all the trauma that we feel? We just want to be, we want to love and be loved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And pretty much, it, it's fairly amazing that spirit is inside you, loving you, but you're looking outside for it to come in. And of course, it's like being a fish in the ocean. You're looking all over for the water. You can't find it. Right. Because <laughs> you're right in the middle of it. <laughs> Do we notice the air? No, we don't. Only when it's gone. So yeah. I, True. I got into seminary and then I um, took a bit of a side trip some someone i know says that these things are planned before we're even born so i can only hope that that was true for me i ended up as a single mom living in the country uh i was still going to church um and i started writing the church bulletin in that church the the minister and his wife were just wonderful people absolutely wonderful people and very very uh progressive for that time this would be the early 70s kind of like when unity church the when they took christianity to a new level yes it was very similar to that yeah he was a pacifist and that was not very popular during the vietnam war true he went up a redwood tree several hundred feet not not several dozen feet sorry they're not that tall uh and his wife fed him from the bottom of the tree for six months while he protested against the war mm. and i had been raised very conservative very republican very 
mm, scared of the Russians coming over and taking us over and killing us all and taking all our stuff and whatever they were supposed to do, you know. Such a farce. It wasn't it. But I was a kid during that Wait. time. I didn't know. Oh, we all got I, it. Yeah, we all got that. I had and... no clue. So I went to this guy's church. I had my daughter baptized there. It's a Methodist church. United Methodist. And uh, he gave a sermon one time about uh, his pacifism. I don't remember the exact details of it mm -hmm. or anything. And I went home and I was like, Darn, I was just getting to like this place. And, and now here they're telling me I need to be a pacifist. And I'm like, what? And the answer was, I told you to love your enemies, not to nuke them to death. Right. And I said, oh. And that just rearranged all the furniture in my head. Because it was very direct this is what i told you you're gonna go with it or not right it's not forced it's that subtle uh, what yeah. they call the still small voice yeah that, only uh, it wasn't very still <laughs> <laughs> well it's not when and not in that your case bell either. Of truth is rung within you right it just reverberates yeah. in your whole body and it's like oh shit i gotta <laughs> yeah i gotta rethink this whole thing yeah and so um been through all kinds of because of looking for this permanent direct connection which you know i know it's there and practically everybody who's spiritual at all says that it is mm -hmm. some even say yeah it is possible to be in connection all the time uh i started trying to practice meditation and, you know, all the things they tell you to do. Mm -hmm. a, a person who teaches meditation 2.0 now says they're only telling you what worked for them or that they heard worked for somebody. Nobody actually knows how this works. <laughs> it's possible immediately if you just believe it. If you just believe that it's possible. Right. So... And, and, you know, you have to change your habits of thought. You have to stop, you know. It's discipline. You must develop a discipline of paying attention to yourself. Yeah. Yeah. But I didn't realize that was it at that time. I, I mean, this is just re very recent for me. Well, um, recent or not. <laughs> To, to put it in the vernacular, hallelujah, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> but if you think it's coming from outside you or inside your head where imagination lives and everything is kind of swirly, I doubt it. I doubt everything. And I doubt it 20 times before I kind of sneak over and put my foot over the... Blind. You begin to acquiesce, right? <laughs> yes, yes. And so just a beautiful experience of, oh gosh, that was 1971. So we're talking. Yeah, 53 years 30, 40, maybe even 50 years yeah. of trying different things, finding they don't work. Listening to this person, listening to that person. And finally, it just, it got through to me. I was listening to this guy that channels uh, some angelic being. And the, ch the channel said that God was saying to all of us, why don't you just sit and let yourself be loved? And I said, oh. Why the hell not? Right. Why don't you do that? And that was happening right here in this little condominium pot complex where we live. I'd sit out in the sun in the morning and just feel the sun loving me. And 
the more I did that, the more um, common to being able to pay attention to the voice became. Mm -hmm. um, somebody Did you learn how to be still? I had always known how to be still physically. True. And even but mentally even is another mentally. story. No, even mentally. Even mentally. But the spirit was just absolutely quiet inside my head. And it was like, there's nothing here. I'm trying to connect, but there's nothing here. And I had to realize that already, and this came through many different things, books, articles, channels, YouTube, you name it. It came all different kinds of ways. As I had so. to realize that Spirit of God is on 24-hour broadcast on planet Earth. Mm -hmm. And you only have to say, I'm here. That's all you have to do. Right. That, absolutely. And there's this, there's this sense, you know, the, what I've learned at end is that we can't think our way through a system built on vibration. We've got to sense our way through. Yeah. And in so doing, this reflects on the the sensation that I felt when I prayed to know what truth was, was willing to die for it, ended up in the light as a result. And the first thing that I noticed, uh, other than this, you know, ineffable feeling, is I tried to make it effable. And, <laughs> and so, right? So, and so as this, I'm 18 years old, right? The impetuous curiosity is trying to identify something. And so I came up with effervescent, iridescent, high-pitched sensation is what it mm -hmm. felt like in the light, right? The, mm -hmm. the purity of that. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the experience, I went someplace else, kind of was given my mission for this life, came back. And when I came back with, with a gulp of air and keeping my eyes closed, I retained that sensation. And along with that came the instant recognition that we are all cosmic consciousness, which is what I gave my life up for. My, it, I was asked if I was willing to die for what I believed in. I started with Christ consciousness. It felt a little empty for some reason. I didn't understand why at the time. I do now. I went to cosmic consciousness, which is the formless, the, the infinite intelligence, if you will, that, that Jesus came from. Right? <laughs> and so as I recognize that we're all cosmic consciousness condensed into form, just unaware, it gave me that sense of curiosity as to find out, okay, how does this all fit? What are the different ways? How do I understand it? How do I learn how to facilitate it through people, places, and things to get them to work together better. And so I've been fortunate in being given all kinds of different industry experiences in doing so, which is just phenomenal because nobody else knows about it, right? You don't have to talk about it in that, which I'm kind of a blabbermouth. So in some places when I would talk about it, I'd end up outside looking in really quick. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that's the, sti the the stigma that is placed on you um, at that time. That's today, a belief. Much different, right? Yeah, yeah. It's a there's a much different mm, perspective, I, uh, for lack of a better, between a belief system and an experience system. Right. Now, what do we base right. our truth on, really? has to be the experience it really does Doesn't but if it? you don't have the experience yet it can only be just trusting your life and yourself and i did not do that well you gotta I ask doubt it. first of all right yeah. so, okay i figured out what not to do <laughs> <laughs> yeah i could give you 150 things not to do right <laughs> Well, but don't you find that in, in life, we're kind of taught to think about what we don't want first yeah, and then produce it for some reason. So we're thinking about it. Exactly. <laughs> yes. So if we want to love and be loved, what do we do? 
we've got to love self first. And most of the time we don't. Mm-hmm. Right. Of those 70,000 thoughts a day, and our good friend Melissa Hughes offered that information to us. Right. Yeah. Of those, probably two thirds of them, if not more, are self deprecating. Yeah. Because we're unconscious of them. We just let it roll. And, and we're used to this almost self annihilation. Well, we're programmed just like a computer. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing comes up, it reminds you of what was said, and that plays and plays and plays and plays and plays until you say, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. So asking questions is the way I got through all of that doubt and everything else. Now, do you find that asking questions, because I do that too, it often creates the adverse effect of, of people feeling confronted, especially when you're asking important questions that they have a belief for, but not an experience of mm-hmm. in an answer. Yeah. 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 And the thing is, you, you are making a distinction, which is real, between what your mind thinks over and over and is programming itself to do as you go along. Mm -hmm. And what is actually the light inside of you thinking, which as you said, sometimes comes out in an interior voice, but often comes out in a question or a statement like the one that was made to me. I was asking, The day after that accident, I was on cloud 110. No doubt. For the entire week, I was walking off the ground. On the way back from work one day, just walking up the sidewalk to the house, I had this thought. What if this is all just me convincing myself? Bang! Off of cloud nine into the basement, I threw myself on the bed and I said, are you real? And there was this quiet for a while. And then the answer was, if I told you, it wouldn't be any fun. So all of this searching and trying to figure out who the spirit is and what the spirit is and everything else, all this moving into trust from distrust and doubt, all of that is relational. It's the way we get to be with other people. And that is what's fun to God. And excruciatingly fun to us. Yes, sometimes. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, I, spent, go... I spent so many years looking for what I could do for God. And finally, the question that freed me was, God doesn't need it, me to do anything. I am God inside. And it will do whatever it thinks of to do. Mm -hmm. And I just go along, as you said, in excruciating terror (laughs) some of the time. (laughs) Right. Well, you know, I think what we, it seems, whether I think or not, I have the sense that we've gone throughout history with millennia of trauma because of the patriarchal system that has tried to rule and in, in including rewriting the beginning of things and making women subservient to man. How ridiculous is that? Now, there's good things in that volume. Absolutely. However, there's some things that just don't make sense. Yet it does when you think about ruling parties back then that were attempting to bridge church and state and rule with an iron fist, which is what Constantine was doing at the Council of Nicaea, which is where all that was um, canonized. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we get through that, though? How do we recognize that, you know, 
we're all equal in the eyes of God. And certainly from that perspective, as God within, we ought to be all equal to each other. Now, we just have different skill sets. We have, you know, we're calling all, all those kinds of things, which there's a litany of things that are written about as far as all the gifts and tools and things that we have available. And yet there's this lack of harvesting the past in order to move into the future with no attachment to it. We're still dragging it with us as baggage on this mm -hmm. wonderful flight. And we've not got the memo that there's no carry-ons. <laughs> and we have to pay $200 for it too. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and we don't get to pass go. That's uh, correct. <laughs> how do you find that this is emerging in a different order because there's you know there's three new world orders trying to vie for attention right now uh, and and it's all prescriptive command and control kinds of things yet as we're talking there's a whole nother thing going on that uh, to put it in the vernacular kingdom within right and we're taught to make the without as the within first developing the self-love and the direct connect within mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, in this, that being natural, above and beyond anything else, as we've discovered, and others like us have, how do you see that assisting in the emergence of a true new world order that we've been told the apocalypse, right? The uncovering of knowledge, which is what the word means. It doesn't mean catastrophic end of the earth. That's uh, that's just preposterous to, to even consider and how well marginalized we've been because you ask anybody what apocalypse means and I bet nine, nine, nine out of ten will say oh it's the end of the earth mm -hmm. and when it's yeah. that's not what the word means it means uncovering knowledge hidden yeah. knowledge we've all got that knowledge hidden within us mm -hmm. now how does it emerge how does it demonstrate how does it reflect in ourselves and others as we move into this new era the age of aquarius you know there's all kinds of indicators from all walks of life and pretty much prophecies from every religion that indicates that we're in a crux period where we're going to have this massive evolutionary opportunity yeah and i see I see it very clearly. At first, I was really depressed, thinking everything, all of our infrastructure is collapsing. Certainly in the U.S., I'm not sure. Well, it's collapsing in Ecuador too, oh, yeah, but to we're very close to the U.S. All over the world, yeah. <laughs> Education crashed. It is now no longer possible to get an education, no matter how much money you pay, and you don't have any money anyway. 50 people have it. So, you know, we are being forced to meet human needs. We need to educate the young. We do, they don't come in knowing engineering or whatever. No, now here's one thing, <laughs> if I may interrupt you. Um, my wife who grew up in the uh, USSR, and she was trained as a piano pedagogue. They chose her at five years old to give her a choice of gymnastics oh, or piano. She chose piano because it had more longevity. And because <laughs> they explained, you know, look, if you go gymnastic route, your body's going to have some problems more than likely at some point. Piano, she didn't see that. So she, <laughs> and she became this amazing pianist. Now, the difference in their education as compared to American education is that they actually did an assessment on the child before doing anything mm -hmm. and gave them a choice of what direction to go with the educated guesses based on the assessments, mm -hmm. right? And actually wanting to serve the kid, not put the kid in a box and, and teach him how to regurgitate, mm -hmm. which is what we've done in America. We, you know, the educational system here was developed to produce factory workers, not free things. Yeah. Right, right. And voters. You know, right. who would 
do what they were told. But um, there is in New York, I've heard about it. I don't remember the name of it, unfortunately. I'm no good with names, but uh, this is a school where the kids attend. It's a private school. I don't know if they have scholarships or whatever, which is important to me, but I don't know if they have it. Mm -hmm. When the kid comes into the classroom for the first time, they um, lay out in front of him or her all these possibilities of things to learn about or play with or interact with or whatever. And the kid gets to choose. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to learn, I don't know what, chemistry. I'd like to know how to mix all these things up so I can do something with it. Uh, well, for that, you're going to have to learn basic math to start with. But, you know, we'll show you that, but we'll also show you about chemistry. Right. So the child is not being treated as tabula rasa, which is the basic outlook of the American educational system. We can put whatever information we want into this kid. I ask any primary school teacher and they'll tell you that's an absolute falsehood. But that's how it's based. We memorize the mem multiplication tables and we do long division. Oh, God, I thought it was a prison sentence, the whole fourth grade. <laughs> I kind of loved it because I was good at math. Oh, okay. Um, like I said, you know, earlier I, I had a high intelligence, so I was pretty much good at anything and didn't really have that many difficult with difficulties with it and didn't realize why, right? Mm -hmm. it, it was just fun for me. Yeah. It was learning yeah. it was absorbing teaching high yeah. school. I ended up, uh, teaching at a district school, three different charter schools and a residential treatment center. Uh, at one of the charter schools, I built multiple intelligence learning centers. And then at the end of that, for my second master's degree in organizational management, I wrote a business plan for model school based mm -hmm. on holistic education, which includes mm -hmm. body, mind, spirit, planet, mm -hmm. cosmos. Because we have, you know, there's this interstellar relationship that we have that we don't even recognize because we think right. we're one planet and we're not part of anything else. Well, no, you know, we have to master case, neighborhood. Well, right. And if that <laughs> were the case, why would astrology make such a big difference in people's lives and be so accurate in stating, you know, the different things that people go through and issues they have to address and things like that. It's phenomenal. Human designs even more so because it mm -hmm. includes um the the vedas kabbalah i ching astrology and, and i think there's a couple of other things but the, and especially with the use of ai to combine all of those things together and, and give a person a potential clearer picture of themselves it's a way to reflect it and mm -hmm. find the strengths that you have and capitalize on those it, it's phenomenal and, and i can't stress that you know um at least looking into it and seeing because that's the science that backs up the spirit mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and going back to your question everything has to collapse before you can see what's growing up in the cracks mm -hmm. And I think that our job for a lot of us is to investigate, see what's growing, see what you want to nurture and fertilize and water. Um, and those that, such as the World Economic Forum's plans, mm -hmm. just don't bother with them. <laughs> it's not under your nose, right? It, 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 pay attention. One of the things that I found is if you just look around you, you're safe, right? Some aren't. I get that. So yeah. this isn't 100% applicable. Yeah, not in Palestine. You're not safe. Right. But, yeah. However, the most, the majority of us, especially in first world countries, are safe. Mm -hmm. 
So why worry about anything else? Just do what's in front of you to do. And if you don't know what to do, ask the question and remain somewhat quiet for a little bit and it will show up under your nose. Guaranteed. Yes. yes, it will. It will. And that's one of the things I wanted to say today. If you ask for guidance, you will always get it. You just have to look for it. Mm -hmm. And if you get it three times in a row, as happens to me frequently, that's it. <laughs> that's that, you know, hey, 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 you. <laughs> yeah, it's the trifecta, I call it. Right? <laughs> and the Trinity yeah. manifests everywhere. I mean, you know, we see it as a macro Trinity, the micro Trinity and the proton, electron, and neutron, right? It's managed by the consciousness in the space between the vibrating strings that make up those elements. Mm -hmm. And it gives you a whole nother sense, right? It, you Because you go, we're kind of stuck in the middle, right? Because we're sentient beings aware of the macro and the micro and having to navigate through it effectively with a consciousness that acquiesces to a more harmonious or, or something in alignment with our own personal nature, which also reveals itself in that process. Mm -hmm. That really seems to. I have been developing without thinking so much, but you know, just pieces. Mm -hmm. It's like putting together a jigsaw puzzle. But I have been developing this Oh, you could call it a theory. Call it a theory. I don't care. That there is a Bible verse. And I don't quote them lightly. But this one is fun, fundamental, foundational to me. In him, meaning God or the spirit, whatever, we live and move and, and have be our being. Absolutely. What that means to me is that in that little trinity you were talking about, that middle part that governs all the interactions, that is God. And so every one of our cells is interpenetrated with the Holy Spirit. And every one of everybody else's and all the trees and all the plants and all the animals, the air, the water... This is all God's body. Yep. Absolutely. And I just happen to be a part of it. <laughs> yeah. And that's the spiritual perspective and, and mm -hmm. view, right? And then you've got mm -hmm. now quantum physics that is saying, yes, that's true. We don't quite understand it yet. Yeah. However, through experimentation, we've determined it is true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that yeah. gives us another opportunity with those that are secular, atheist, really it doesn't matter, right? Because God's, Who the, limits you know, there's no judgments on how you believe or choose to believe. No, but, but people, especially scientists, traditionally have limited themselves to interact with only that which they can touch, feel, the see, material world. understand. Yes. There is actually no such thing. Right. And so now all the concepts of science are being rebuilt. So in a way, science itself is collapsing and being reorganized yep. and coming back out with new theories. Oh, to yeah. test I stuck my and refine. <laughs> I stuck my foot in the mouth with uh, Dr. Irvin Laszlo and, you know, the common knowledge I, I thought was that, you know, in quantum physics, there's 99 percent space and one percent material thinking of the the tig lease right the and he says you know i would say there's 100 percent energy mm -hmm. yeah and i was like oh yeah. yep but the, <laughs> there was a bell rung right? yes everything is energy and that's what gives me hope about what we're seeing growing up from the ashes. If you look at a place that fires have gone through and wiped everything out, the first things to come up are the invasive weeds. 
you know, fireweed and mm -hmm. um, thistles and all that kind of stuff. But the next things to come up are little trees and they're, you know, softwood species. But then after that come the hardwood trees and all of this. This does not happen by accident. It has a pattern. It is reproduced every time there's a fire, mm -hmm. unless there's an intervention so that it doesn't have the natural regrowth. But right. yeah, or it's clear. What does that tell you? <laughs> what does that tell you? Life, God, spirit, whatever you want to call it, has a will. Mm -hmm. And if what Jesus said is true, that will always be done. The so will. we don't it seems have like to, the will to grow doesn't it it seems like the will to be mm. to be simply that and that's all we have to do i'm learning just be let the light shine that's what i got told i was saying well what should i do now i'm retired and i could do this and i could do that and i could do more retreats and all this kind of stuff but the answer was, shine your light. End of story. And you are. You really are. The, the way that you speak, the things that you know to be true, how you found them, it's congruent beyond uh, questioning the, uh, the truth of it. It just... You feel it in your voice, in your countenance, in, in the words that you speak, in the experiences that you've had. Could that be the difference that others sense when we are around them and where no words need to be spoken, yet the atmosphere of the room changes? Do you yeah, have that that's, that's the energy. That's the light. Yeah, I see, I see it in people's eyes. I read a story once about a man who had died and been revived. Mm -hmm. And he was very sad for a few months. He was just so sad because it was so lovely where he was after he died. And um, he was given a gift, just like you were given a gift standing there at the window, holding on. Mm -hmm. He was given a gift. Every person that he saw for months afterwards had the same eyes as Jesus. And it's just a matter of the energy. It's not the physical thing itself, which mm -hmm. I get cool, fooled by all the time, but it isn't. It's that no, we equate that because we don't know what to do with it. Yeah. Right? We want to make, we want has, to bring it down to the physical level. Spirit has a character it has a personality that has a gestalt mm. that is absolutely purely intelligence and love and humor i have to add god is also a big joker and a rather sick sense of humor at that <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm sure the hippopotamus feels like that. <laughs> it's probably why he's so grumpy. <laughs> well, and, and, you know, some of the best ways for us to learn are through the sarcastic comments that mm -hmm. wake us up to, oh, yeah, that was kind of silly. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. how do you see the, the, in this, let me ask this differently. What would you offer as opportunities or advice for current generations and future generations to be able to explore, maybe understand this kind of lifestyle a little better, or even the encouragement just to open the door? Well, the answer to that, thank God, is very simple. Very simple. I believe in a keep it simple, stupid method. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's the method that God uses all the time. <laughs> when I wake up in the morning, 
I recognize the spirit inside of me saying, I love you. Glad you're here. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this body. And say it to yourself because God is in you in such a way that you cannot be divided from it. Just like we can't be divided from the air that we're breathing. It's concept air, but it's actually something with oxygen in it that's keeping all of ourselves alive. Mm -hmm. So just say, I love you to that. I love you. And I'm glad you're here. And what's, what's on for today? What do I look for today? And you will get an answer. You will. And you will also get a hug back. Then when the day opens up, do what's in front of you to be done. I was advised that by a very wise Filipino woman, woman about 20 years ago uh, who started a neighborhood papermaking industry in the rural area of the Philippines. And um, 20 years later, she had 400 neighbors engaged in this occupation and it was uh, raising money, funds for kids going to school, high school, college, stuff like that. Mm. So she said it. I wake up in the morning, I give thanks, and I go into my office and I do what's in front of me. So that's it. And when things go pear-shaped, this is from my friend Johanna, pause, breathe, realize that the divine is breathing life into you all the time. Look with kind eyes on yourself and others. Mm -hmm. Realize, as someone else said, that everything is either a cry for love or an expression of love. Step into that river and take in love for yourself and give out love to others near you. The words of Jesus, love others as you love yourself. Maybe it should be updated. Love yourself as much as you love others. Wonderful new twist and still the same. I mean, it's the love, the, the, the love and be loved. And thank yeah. you so much, Suzanne. This was uh, just amazing. And I love you. I love you too. <laughs> and many blessings to your beautiful Russian wife. Well, thank you. Uh, and she is uh, many blessings for me and, and I for her. We have really had a wonderful amalgamation and transcendence of culture to form our own and recognize that connection that we have to the divine and are living in it um, as much as humanly possible right now. Mm -hmm. It's just amazing. And the more we do, the more things appear. That and are, the more you want to, the more you do it, the more you want to do yeah. it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it, it's just yes. comes natural after a point. It's like, why mess with the other stuff when you know this is much more pure and genuine, authentic, real, lasting, yeah, and trustworthy. Mm -hmm. And that's probably the most important point. Because if we live with doubt and fear, as I have done for most of my life. We're missing so much. And and what have we gained? We've gained nothing. Mm -hmm. We either lean in and trust gravity to hold us, trust the spirit to guide us and hold us in life, in this life or whatever other life there is, or we just live in fear. What is the point? I decided many, many times over and over again, okay, I am stepping out on that because this other has given me nothing. Mm -hmm. And yeah. maybe I'll fall through, but I'll fall through anyway if I don't do it. Sure. <laughs> and in the process, you'll experience happiness beyond your imagination. Yes. True Isn't joy. Proof. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm. Yes. 
so wonderful to have your time present insight presence with a, a C E N and N T S with <laughs> gifts you. of insight and wisdom today, Suzanne. It, it's thank just you. been wonderful, and I thank you again for the time spent shared. Thank you. It was it was a pleasure. I really enjoyed hearing your story too. Well, good and. Now it's available to share with others and ripple through the thought and the sphere and the love that we want to share and have yeah. them experience too. That's a great word. Thank you. And namaste and in la catch. And thank you for sticking with us for this episode of One World in a New World. I'm sure you got some new insights and wisdom for your own journey. And I'm Zen Benefield. I'll see you next time.